Hello, my name is Hui Tran. I'm with Aquatic Equipment and Design, and we uh, supply, design, and integrate um, RAS system. So today I'm just gonna go over some basic components and design principles in RAS. Um, why RAS? Uh, why we use water? Um, really, the, the big things are to minimize water usage, uh, conserve heat or um, water temperature, um, decrease water demand, decrease uh, wastewater uh, discharge, basically. Uh, big thing is increase biosecurity and then um, a smaller uh, discharge are easier to prevent escape, of course. Um, smaller inlets are easier and cheaper to disinfect. Um, and all this can be done in a controlled environment. Uh, priorities in RES, a lot of times is not defined. Uh, the big priority should be, it should be sustainable. Um, so low head, so lower energy costs, pumping costs. Um, when touch on low energy, zero to near zero effluent or discharge uh, would be nice if we see more lower tropic uh, level species. And then the big one uh, is much be, uh, must be financially sustainable. Um, the, to differentiate, differentiate uh, between um, RAS systems, um, I broke it down into small RAS, which is kind of like hobby or education system. Commercial RAS um, also can be broken down into entry level, uh, kind of like a more boutique um, size, industrial scale system, um, intensive versus super intensive system. And then of course, vertically integrated system where you have hatchery, nursery, or aquaponics to process your, your uh, uh, discharge, uh, and then, of course, processing and marketing. Um, RAS tilapia, um, you have to kind of decide where um, where your niche is, whether it be tilapia or some high value species, of course. Uh, production system should be supported by <laughs> credible design uh, process. Uh, it should be a proven RAS design. Uh, we've seen a lot of designs that are not proven um, and this could cause uh, significant um, uh, delay in return on investment if you ever get return on investment. Uh, when designing a RAS, um, before purchasing an existing system, investors should definitely undertake a comprehensive financial analysis. Basically, do your due diligence. It's very, very important. And then as a consumer or a uh, investor, you should also look at some of the options that you want in your RAS design. Um, it's just like buying a car. You need to define what you must have and what you would like to have. Some of these options can increase your cost significantly without adding or benefiting your return on investment. Um, the, the big thing is always think about how any added piece of equipment will add to your return or take away from your return uh, on investment. Uh, don't recreate the wheel. There's, there's a lot of technology that's out there. There's a lot of design that's been done. So look at your um, uh, maximum feed uh, rate, controlled environment, rapid solid removal, and the efficiency of your uh, biological filtration, actually efficiency in general. Um, and how and where to integrate and what to integrate, what components to integrate into your system. Uh, poor design really leads to uh, your system not being usable. Um, and in the design phase, you should really give feedback or have a good understanding of the initial design of the system. Uh, definitely take a, a serious part in that and participate in your own design. That also will help dictate your skill level to the designer and let them know what your skill levels are and they could design a system that's more appropriate 
for your need and your levels of uh, husbandry or even LSS, um, life support uh, uh, equipment. Really beware the aqua shysters, uh, salespeople, paper engineer. As for the background, definitely do the due diligence because this is going to be one of the greatest investment or the you know the the largest investment that you do uh, in your life. This is going to be greater than your home, your car. Uh, so uh, be very aware. Some poor design that we see. I could probably do a PowerPoint hours long on poor design. So just be aware of that. Um, you know, this is a really bad example. They didn't even have any idea where these inlets were coming from. So we had them label it. And this is still just a nightmare, uh, but there's tons of these out there. Uh, components of RES um, are pretty simple. The, the main thing is your culture uh, tank or your holding vessel. Uh, aeration, oxygenation, uh, you have to kind of pick that based on your density and based on availability and also costs. Uh, disinfection, solid waste, mechanical filtration, uh, biological filtration, uh, your nitrification, and then carbon dioxide removal based on density. Uh, some other um, ancillary component, uh, monitoring control, uh, this is where you can definitely get out of control with uh, needs versus uh, wants. Um, mineralization is a process of uh, breaking down your um, solid waste and whether you apply it onto a field or using an aquaponic system, um, that's things to consider. And also, of course, biosecurity. The basic system component, we kind of touched on that already. Uh, culture tank, water movement. Uh, filtration uh, broken down into mechanical and biological, gas control, whether you're oxygenating, aerating, or degassing, uh, disinfection. Currently, the two most popular disinfection method in uh, RES is UV um, and ozone, and of course, monitoring controls. Um, culture tank, it's, it's crucial to do design it appropriately, but also to design it where you're able to do a single harvest from the tank. You don't want a tank that's so big that you're going to have to be, you know, with such density that you're going to have to be in there multiple times to harvest um, or multiple cycles or si a harvest cycle. And what that does is stresses out the fish and they can do uh, problems with disease or, you know, uh, mortality. Um, some basic tank design is, you know, width versus height. Uh, dictates your flow rate, uh, the type of drain you use. Um, uh, this is all pretty basic, but you'll be amazed at some of the tank designs that we've seen out there. And then cost is going to be a big issue also. So take those into consideration. Um, tank design material. Um, material used for tank construction must be durable, smooth, inert, um, and non-toxic, uh, food grade basically. Uh, tank construction, fiberglass, uh, HDPE, concrete, steel with epoxy paint, corrugated steel with liner. Um, the other one, I would say there's a, a stainless steel tank with a glass bonded. Uh, at this time, it's very difficult for any of these tanks to, to uh, be constructed at a reasonable price. Uh, prices have gone up 30 40% within the last uh, six months. So uh, if you're doing something um, or planning to do something soon, be aware of the price increase due to uh, material and shipping costs. Water movement, uh, pumps are the most common device. There's air lifts, there's you know, all kinds of other methods, but pumps are definitely the most commonly used in um, our, our RAS system. Uh, sizing is definitely depends on uh, system volume and uh, your turnover rate. Uh, typical RAS, uh, whether it be salt water or um, fresh water, is about 30 to 60 minutes um, turnover. Um, and then the types of pumps include centrifugal, uh, vertical turbine, submersible, and magnetic drive. I leave those two separate because uh, they tend to be for a smaller system. Um, there are submersible that are quite large but I really uh, don't kind of prefer using those. They are um, usually oil filled 
and there's electricity submerged in the water. So um, we tend to use the centrifugal and vertical turbine more often. Um, proper sizing is very, very important um, with efficiency and cost and then the longevity of your pump. So use those vendor to size things correctly for you. That's their job. Uh, filtration, um, mechanical specifically, is designed to remove solids. That's all it is. It's a solids uh, filter. Um, you know, a lot of RAS the de um, uh, design incorporates a, a double drain system. So the more heavy solids are filtered down from 100 microns um, uh, and larger. And then there's a secondary mid-level that's filtered to uh, anywhere from 60 to 20 micron. Uh, mechanical filters should be able to be clean or backwash adequately. Um, you don't want any of that nutrient to kind of leach back in constantly. Um, and it should be um, kind of automated and then use minimal amount of water if possible. Rule of thumb, basically one pound of feed will produce 0.3 pounds of solid or one kilo of feed will produce 0.3 kilos of solids that has to be filtered out. And this is some of the, uh, this has been around for quite a while, uh, some basic uh, filtration and the particle size that it removes too. Uh, drum screen filter is probably the most common uh, that's used in RAS. It's used in medium to large RAS system. A variety of screen size and flow rates are available. Uh, it's usually sized in milligrams per liter, um, your total dissolved solids, and then the gallons uh, liter or liters per second. Uh, gravity feed, they're low pressure, self-cleaning. The nice thing is they remove the waste as it comes into the filter. They don't trap the waste and let it leaches out, kind of like a bead filter. So drum filter is definitely the preferred way to go. These are examples of some uh, nice drum filters in the industry. There are a lot of drum filters out there now. I see a lot of plastic ones or uh, ones more specifically for the koi industry. They don't tend to be as robust and they don't have the um, replacement part uh, relative, um, uh, relative ease to purchase. So uh, be aware of those. I would stick with the major brands. Um, the support, technical support and uh, product support is much better. Uh, bead and sand filter are fixed bed filters. Um, backwash is usually accomplished by reverse uh, flow on the water. Uh, some have assisted backwash, like a blower or a, a prop to agitate the, um, the filter bed. And they're usually medium uh, pressure and they're relatively easy to get. Um, there's quite a few of them out in the industry. These are the pressurized bead filters that are kind of in the industry. Um, another filter is a separator. Uh, or a selling filter, radio flow, um, uh, swirl separator, um, or passive filtration, uh, very low energy usage, excellent for, um, they do a really good job for removing large solid, uh, but it usually has to be combined with additional filter to remove the smaller solids. When I say large, um, they're probably, at best about 400 microns. Uh, anything smaller will usually get through or a portion of that solid will get through if it's smaller than about 400 micron. Uh, basic operation of a swirl separator. Um, you can see this on uh, many publications and stuff like that. Here are some examples of sellers. Um, and then uh, Another filtration that's really important is biological filters. Um, uh, they're essentially um, they're they're essentially just surface area, where bacteria can populate and um, take care of your uh, nitrification cycle. It's very important to understand that you're looking for usable surface area versus total surface area. Uh, some media claims you know uh, tremendous surface area but that surface area can get blind or blocked quite easily 
Uh, so you're always talking about usable surface area. And this is the process of uh, nitrification. Um, it's a pretty simple process. And then again, these are uh, what we look for in the media for biological filtration. It's surface area and again, usable surface area. It's just protected living space for nitrifying bacteria. And uh, we wanna exclude competition um, with heterotrophic bacteria. Um, and it has to be a good aerobic living condition for these organisms. Some basic rule of thumbs, a kilogram or a pound of feed will produce uh, 0.03 kilograms of ammonia or 0 0.03 uh, pounds of ammonia uh, prospectively. Uh, biofiltration, uh, some basic, one gram of ammonia will produce 4.4 uh, grams of nitrate, uh, consume, uh, produce uh, 5.9 grams of carbon dioxide, it will consume 4.34 grams of O2 and also consume 7.15 grams of alkalinity. That's why we constantly have to add in alkalinity into our systems. High nitrate, this is very, uh, nitrite, I'm sorry. It's very common, um, especially with a system that is not balanced correctly uh, or startup. Uh, we mostly uh, see this in a uh, startup system um, and then also biofilters that were sized with total surface area versus usable surface area. So not, um, not enough or not adequate uh, surface area or um, it has a low oxygen. Uh, effluent coming from your biofilter, leaving your biofilter should be at least 1.5 um, to 2.0 milligrams per liter in uh, dissolved oxygen. I prefer much higher than that, but that's the minimum. Um, biofiltration, um, when we're talking about low head, we're usually talking about mix uh, or moving mix bed bioreactor, uh, trickling uh, downflow uh, biofilter uh, or the rotating biological uh, contactor, uh, RBCs. They're not used as much anymore. Um, there are some that are still out there, but not as much. And then the smurts biofilter, um, uh, that's also used not as much anymore. Uh, this is an example of a moving bed bioreactor um, as uh, a plastic media that is slightly negative in buoyancy and is aerated heavily. Um, uh, that keeps the, a good protective surface area for your um, bacteria and the aeration which causes the movement will help scrub off dead or old bacteria and um, keep the system uh, aerobic. Trickling downflow, uh, it's pretty common um, in smaller system. Um, the design, especially on the left, are more common for the smaller system. The design with the polystyrene microbeads um, can be used in larger system. They are quite messy. And over, t uh, but it's so cheap. But over time, they can uh, compress and end up into your um, culture tank. Uh, we have found these in fish gut before, and then they will make it into your pumps. So just be aware and plan accordingly if you decide to use that uh, type of media. RBC, uh, the rot rotating biological contactor, um, they can get quite heavy. Um, I've seen a uh, three inch steel shaft uh, bent because of the uh, weight once the bacteria is populated and it's been in use for a long time. There are ones that are made that are floating that has a almost a reverse paddle wheel and the air rotates it. Um, the problem that I see in these is over time, uh, bacteria can populate on one side or the other or not populate evenly. So they become lopsided and they don't rotate as well. So Morse biofilter, um, not, uh, not one of my higher recommendation, if ever. <laughs> um, they're just harder to clean, uh, weight becomes an issue, and then water distribution uh, through them uh, is an issue, but they have been used and are still being used in, in many areas. 
um, biological filtration, uh, nitrification, pressurized system um, are usually fluidized uh, bead or sand filter. Um, and we find a lot of these in the cooler or colder water system. Um, they tend to function better in warm water system. Uh, the biofilm develop almost too fast for some of these systems. And then we find uh, media in uh, our culture tanks and our pumps. Um, there are uh, systems that uses uh, bead filters for biological. I do, however, recommend to either use them as mechanical or biological in different vessels. Uh, if you use them in the same vessel to do both mechanical and biological, you limit capacity of, of it doing either one. Uh, as you backwash your uh, bead filter to uh, take care of the organic load, you're actually backwashing some of your uh, nitrifying bacteria out of your system. Um, and it, if you backwash um, uh, incorrectly, you can wash out a lot of your uh, nitrifying bacteria. And the price is significant. Uh, these are some of the uh, fluidized bead filters. Um, they do have a glass media that you can fluidize also. Um, it's good surface area, uh, but it has to be sized appropriately. As the bacteria develops on it, um, it can uh, change its density um, and can be blown out of the system. Uh, likewise with sand, uh, fluidized sand filter. These are some basic designs of fluidized sand filter, uh, psycho bio, um, just a vertical sand, and then there's a conical, it changes velocity as the cone opens up. Um, you do have to plan for contingency to catch the sand as it leaves because all sand filter, fluidized sand filter will lose sand at one time or another. Uh, as the biofilm develop on a fluidized sand filter, it changes the density and the displacement, and then you will get uh, a sand particle that's encrusted or encoded with your um, um, bacteria, and then it'll get uh, blown out into your system. So uh, there has to be contingency to capture that. Um, oxygen uh, provisions, um, you can use either pure oxygen, liquid or generated. Um, it is uh, uh, recommended at a stocking density uh, above uh, 30 to 40 um, uh, kilograms per uh, kiloliters. Uh, RAS require high stocking density and high growth rate to be economically viable. Uh, so auction additions should be considered during the design um, to take advantage of the saving capital related to the economy of scale. And also check the cost of your auction locally versus uh, electricity costs. Uh, that may change your, uh, your selection uh, options. Uh, auctionation uh, source uh, of auction can be generated uh, be aware of your generator auction. Um, these generators prefer dry, cool air. Um, so where we do a lot of our work, it's not dry or cool most of the time. So uh, have plans for that. Uh, liquid oxygen is, is nice uh, or cylinders. The cylinder auction tend to be more of a backup. So, um, but it's, it's still used in certain facilities as uh, the main uh, source of oxygen. Uh, applications, uh, down flow contactor, uh, LHO, low head oxygenator, and then counter uh, flow or diffusion columns are the methods to deliver uh, oxygen into your system. Here's some example of oxygen generators. Um, uh, liquid oxygen, some examples of that. And then some uh, examples of down uh, flow contactors, uh, the cones or saturators are um, what we see pretty common. We do see quite a bit of LHOs, um, good designed uh, LHO are very efficient. Um, th there is a significant cost due to the complexity, um, but they're quite efficient because of the low energy usage. Some counter flow uh, diffusion, I don't see these as much anymore. Um, uh, but they are still out there. Oxygen contactor, um, 
oxygen absorbs uh, efficiency is 80 to 90 percent. Actually, I usually see them quite a bit higher than that uh, with the better designs nowadays. Uh, aeration should be used with less than a lot less than 30 to uh, 40 uh, kg. Uh, diffuse air stone, uh, mechanical agitator, and then pack column uh, aerators. Uh, it, it is important to take into consideration your elevation. Um, if the whoever is sizing or designing your system, not asking about elevation, if you decide to use air, that's a problem. You can see the availability of oxygen in air and the uh, effective oxygen percent uh, column. Uh, as you go up, you lose quite a bit of uh, oxygen, the percentage of oxygen in uh, air. So be aware of that. Most facilities or most vendors list their regenerative blower or uh, uh, air compressor at sea level. So that shows at 20.9 or 21% oxygen in the air. So if you're sizing based on that uh, and you live uh, in Pikes Peak, Colorado, uh, you're going to have some problems. So um, be aware of that. Uh, medium pore diffuser was the industry and still is the industry standard uh, for um, uh, diffusers um, in the aquaculture industry. They were actually invented by Bob Heidemann and it came to market in 84, uh, but he was already playing around with them in um, I think 82, 83 in his swimming pool. Um, very low resistance, use air. Um, it has a 10% a um, oxygen transfer efficiency. Uh, good product um, um, and, and real robust and real easy to use, uh, easy to clean also. Uh, mechanical aerators and agitators, um, there's definitely usage for this. Uh, just look at your energy costs, though. I would probably not use something like this in Hawaii just because their electric cost is significant. Uh, pack column aerators, uh, just some examples of them. Um, CO2 uh, will definitely be a problem in RAS when pure oxygen is used uh, because of the higher stocking density and the um, higher metabolic rate of your organism. Uh, RAS that use pure oxygen should definitely in, uh, incorporate some type of degassing device. Um, and then just be aware, CO2 is a heavy gas. So if you degas it and don't get it out of your building, it settles and then can be regassed into your system uh, at a higher rate. So just be aware of that. Uh, disease control. Um, disease control system should be incorporated into a RAS system. Um, as a central uh, water treatment element um, for managing fish health, for sure. Uh, the two types, like I said before, is uh, ultraviolet uh, radiation and ozone um, are the two most common. Uh, ozone is a very powerful oxidant. Um, it's been used in aquaculture to improve water quality, uh, reduce pathogen. Uh, pre-treatment uh, of effluent and continued treatment during RES um, operation. Uh, ozone causes clumping or microflocculation. It helps the fines uh, solids uh, to solidify together and, and flocculate and be better um, for your filter to remove. Um, due to its high oxidation potential though, ozone is a, a excellent um, disinfectant, but it's also very dangerous. If you smell ozone, it's already too late. It's doing damage to you. So make sure you have a good ozone design and a size appropriately, and then also a method of monitoring and um, uh, ozone destruct. And there should be some ambient ozone detection uh, as a warning. Um, incorporated into the system. Uh, the other one that's very common to use is UV. Um, and the, the problem that we have with UV, uh, most people, they say, you know, UV doesn't work. The problem is the water is not clear enough. You don't have a good transmittant. So UV is a light. So there has to be a good transmittant rate 
in your water for UVs to work effectively. If it has a, a lot of coloring or a lot of fine particles, um, as that particle passes by the light, it's casting a shadow behind it. So anything be in that shadow is still living. So um, you kind of render your UV uh, ineffective. So you should have a transmittance rate in your water of 90% or better. Uh, talk to your UV manufacturer about that when you're sizing or looking for UV in your system. Monitoring control RAS system should definitely be equipped with some type of monitoring, uh, even the basic monitoring. Um, at density, uh, you know, when a system crash, it, it can crash quite quickly and the result can be significant loss. Uh, multi read parameters uh, should, must be um, monitored. Uh, some parameters like ammonia, nitrite, nitrate uh, are usually done by hand or, you know, lab. Um, continuous monitoring, I would say DO, temperature, uh, flow rate, water level. Um, periodically, monitor should be pH, um, you know, and, and the, your other water uh, quality parameter usually use some type of uh, titration method. The problem with some of these, like uh, ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, um, there are probes that are out there, but they're usually in the high range in it for wastewater application. Uh, we don't have uh, currently any probes that are in the low range um, where it would be safe for us uh, as aquaculturists. The, the water level is important. Um, we had a, a situation where a customer had a DO probe, uh, but they stuck the probe at the top of the water level and uh, one of the employees left a drain open and the water level dropped down low, but the DO show it was everything was still good. They didn't have a water level um, monitor in there and they came into a bunch of fish that were dying or still barely flopping around on the bottom of the tank. So to have monitoring control, it's important, but to have them in the right spot uh, is more important. Some of the open uh, system that are out there uh, can be something simple as a sensor phone, which is very robust, very simple. Uh, household alarm that's been adopted and adapted to our usage in RES. Uh, you can go with much more complex uh, system, but I would say look at what you need to do and if you can get something off the shelf versus recreating your own system, your own programming, uh, it's easier to uh, replace uh, equipment and update equipment if it's something off the shelf. It can be very complex. Um, you can control everything. Um, it's just look at your cost. And everything you do should always be considered on your return on investment. Um, essential components, water supply, culture tank, mechanical filtration, biological filtration, disease control, pumps and plumbing, um, environmental control, uh, gases, and then backup power supply. The nice to have is the infrastructure equipment structure uh, to house your system, water quality monitoring equipment, alarm system, feed system, storage facility, staff amenities like bathroom, break rooms, uh, administrative offices, and then uh, workspace for shops, repairs, and stuff like that. Um, additional components to consider is like a quarantine uh, if you're bringing fish in from uh, a hatchery, a purging facility uh, before your fish goes to market or your product goes to market, um, whether you're gonna produce fry or frangling or manage brood stock, and then Definitely a biosecurity program is, uh, I, was, I should put that over in a must have. Uh, this is just an example of a uh, aquaculture facility um, doing um, aquaponics with their waste discharge. So, any questions? Thank you for your time. <laughs>